New Treasure Seekers by Edith Nesbitt Chapter 8 The Golden Gondola Albert's uncle is tremendously clever, and he writes books. I have told how he fled to southern shores with a lady who is rather nice. His having to marry her was partly our fault, but we did not mean to do it, and we were very sorry for what we had done. But afterwards we thought perhaps it was all for the best, because if left alone he might have married widows, or old German governesses, or Murdstone aunts, like Daisy and Denny have, instead of the fortunate lady that we were the cause of his being married by. The wedding was just before Christmas, and we were all there, and then they went to Rome for a period of time that is spoken of in books as the honeymoon. You know that H.O., my youngest brother, tried to go too, disguised as the contents of a dress basket that was betrayed and brought back. Conversation often takes place about the things you like, and we often spoke of Albert's uncle. One day we had a ripping game of hide-and-seek all over the house and all the lights out, sometimes called devil in the dark, and never to be played except when your father and uncle are out because of the screams which the strongest cannot suppress when caught by he in unexpectedness and total darkness. The girls do not like this game so much as we do, but it is only fair for them to play it. We have more than once played dolls' tea parties to please them. Well, when the game was over, we were panting like dogs on the hearth rug in front of the common room fire, and H.O. said, I wish Albert's uncle had been here. He does enjoy it so. Oswell has sometimes thought Albert's uncle only played to please us, but H.O. may be right. I wonder if they often play it in Rome, H.O. went on. That postcard he sent us, with the collie, what's its name on, you know, the round place with arches. They could have ripping games there. It's not much fun with only two, said Dicky. Besides, Dora said, when people are first married, they always sit in balconies and look at the moon, or else at each other's eyes. They ought to know what their eyes look like by this time, said Dicky. I believe they sit and write poetry about their eyes all day and only look at each other when they can't think of the rhymes, said Noel. I don't believe she knows how, but I'm certain they read aloud to each other out of the poetry books we gave them for wedding presents, Alice said. It would be beastly ungrateful if they didn't, especially with their backs all covered with gold like they are, said H.O. About those books, said Oswald slowly, now for the first time joining in what was being said. Of course it was jolly decent of father to get such ripping presents for us to give them, but I've sometimes wished we'd given Albert's uncle a really truly present that we'd chosen ourselves bought with our own chink. I wish we could have done something for him, Noel said. I'd have killed a dragon for him as soon as look at it and Mrs. Albert's uncle could have been the princess, and I would have let him have her. Yes, said Dicky, and we just have rotten books, but it's no use grizzling over it now. It's all over, and he won't get married again while she's alive. This was true, for we live in England, which is a morganatic empire, where more than one wife at a time is not allowed. In the glorious East, he might have married again and again, and we could have made it all right about the wedding present. I wish he was a Turk for some things, said Oswald, and explained why. I don't think she would like it, said Dora. Oswald explained that if he was a Turk, she would be a turquoise. I think that is the feminine Turk, 
and so would be used to lots of wives and be lonely without them. And just then, you know what they say about talking of angels and hearing the wings. There is another way of saying this, but it is not polite, as the present author knows. Well, just then the postman came, and of course we rushed out, and among father's dull letters we found one addressed to the Bastables Junior. It had an Italian stamp, not at all a rare one, and it was a poor specimen too, and the postmark was Roma. That is what the Italians have got into the habit of calling Rome. I have been told that they put the A instead of the E, because they like to open their mouths as much as possible in that sunny and agreeable climate. The letter was jolly. It was just like hearing him talk. I mean reading, not hearing, of course, but reading him talk is not grammar, and if you can't be both sensible and grammatical, it is better to be senseless. Well, kiddies, it began, and it went on to tell us about things he had seen, not dull pictures and beastly old buildings, but amusing incidents of comic nature. The Italians must be extreme juggernauses, for the kind of things he described to be of such everyday occurring. Indeed, Oswald could hardly believe about the soda-water label that the Italian translated for the English traveller, so that it said, To distrust of the mineral waters, too fountain-like foaming, they spread the shape. Near the end of this letter came this. You remember the chapter of the Golden Gondola that I wrote from the People's Pageant, just before I had the honour to lead to the altar, etc. I mean, the one that ends in the subterranean passage, with Geraldine's hair down, and her last hope gone, and the three villains stealing upon her with the Venetian subtlety in their hearts and Toledo daggers, specially imported, in their garters. I didn't care much for it myself, you remember. I think I must have been thinking of other things when I wrote it, but you, I recollect, consoled me by refusing to regard it as other than ripping. Clinking was, as I recall it, Oswald's consolatory epithet. You'll weep with me, I feel confident, when you hear that my editor does not share your sentiments. He writes me that it is not up to my usual form. He fears that the public, etc., and he trusts that in the next chapter, etc., let us hope that the public will, in this matter, take your views, and not his. Oh, for a really discerning public, just like you, you amiable critics. Albert's new aunt is leaning over my shoulder. I can't break her of the distracting habit. How on earth am I ever to write another line? Greetings to all, from Albert's uncle and aunt. P.S. She insists on having her name put to this, but, of course, she didn't write it. I am trying to teach her to spell. P.S.S. Italian spelling, of course. And now, cried Oswell, I see it all. The others didn't. They often don't when Oswell does. Why, don't you see? He patiently explained, for he knows that it is vain to be angry with people, because they are not so clever as, as other people. It's the direct aspiration of fate. He wants it, does he? Well, he shall have it. What? said everybody. We'll be it. What? was the not very polite remark now repeated by all. Why, his discerning public. And still they all remained quite blind to what was so clear to Oswell, the astute and discernful. It will be much more useful than killing dragons, Oswell went on especially as their aunt Annie 
and it will be a really truly wedding present, just what we were wishing we'd give him. The five others now fell on Oswald, and rolled him under the table, and sat on his head, so that he had to speak loudly and plainly. All right, I'll tell you, in words of one syllable, if you like. Let go, I say. And when he had rolled out with the others, and the tablecloth had caught on H.O.'s boots, and the books and Dora's workbox, and the glass of paint water that came down with it, he said, We will be the public. We will all write to the editor of the People's Pageant, and tell him what we think about the Geraldine chapter. Do mop up that water, Dora. It's running all under where I'm sitting. Don't you think, said Dora, devoting her handkerchief and Alice's in the obedient way she does not always use, that six letters all signed, Bastable, and all coming from the same house, would be rather, rather, a bit too thick. Yes, said Alice, but, of course, we'd have all different names and addresses. We might as well do it thoroughly, said Dicky, and send three or four different letters each, and have them posted in different parts of London. Right-o, remarked Oswell. I shall write a piece of poetry for mine, said Noel. They ought all to be on different kinds of paper, said Oswell. Let's go out and get the paper directly after tea. We did, but we could only get fifteen different kinds of paper and envelopes, though we went to every shop in the village. At the first shop, when we said, Please, we want a penneth worth of paper and envelopes of each of all the different kinds you keep, the lady of the shop looked at us thinly over blue-rimmed spectacles, and said, What for? And H.O. said, To write anonymous letters. Anonymous letters are very wrong, the lady said, and she wouldn't sell us any paper at all. But at the other places we did not say what it was for, and they sold it us. There were bluey and yellowy and grey and white kinds, and some was violet-ish, with violets on it, and some pink with roses. The girls took the floralist ones, which Oswald thinks are unmanly for any but girls, but you excuse their using it. It seems natural to them to mess about like that. We wrote the fifteen letters, disguising our handwritings as much as we could. It was not easy. Oswald tried to write one of them with his left hand, but the consequences were almost totally unreadable. Besides, if any one could have read it, they would only have thought it was written in an asylum for the insane. The writing was so delirious, so he chucked it. Noel was only allowed to write one poem, it began, Oh, Geraldine, oh, Geraldine, you are the loveliest heroine. I never read about one before that made me want to write more poetry. And your Venetian eyes, they must have been an awful size, and black and blue, and like your hair. And your nose and chin were a perfect pair. And so on for ages. The other letters were all saying what a beautiful chapter Beneath the Dog's Home was, and how we liked it better than the other chapters before, and how we hoped the next would be like it. We found out when all too late that H.O. had called it the Dog's Home, but we hoped this would pass unnoticed among all the others. We read the reviews of books in the old spectators and Athenaeums, and put in the words they say there about other people's books. We said we thought that chapter about Geraldine and the garters was subtle and masterly, and ineventful, that it had an old-world charm, and was redolent of the soil. We said, too, that we had read it with breathless interest from cover to cover, and that it had poignant pathos 
and a convincing realism, and the fine flower of delicate sentiment, besides much other rot that the author can't remember. When all the letters were done, we addressed them and stamped them and licked them down, and then we got different people to post them. Our under-gardener, who lives in Greenwich, and the other under-gardener, who lives in Lewisham, and the servants on their evenings out, which they spent in distant spots, like Plasto and Grove Park, each had a letter to post. The piano tuner was a great catch. He lived in Highgate, and the electric bellman was Lambert. So we got rid of all the letters and watched the post for a reply. We watched for a week, but no answer came. You think, perhaps, that we were duffers to watch for a reply when we had signed all the letters with fancy names like Daisy Dolman, Everard St. Moore, and Sir Colmondeley Marjorie Banks, and put fancy addresses on them, like Chatsworth House, Lompit Vale, and the Bungalow, Eaton Square. But we were not such idiots as you think, dear reader, and you are not so extra clever as you think either. We had written one letter. It had the grandest spectator words in it, on our own letter paper, and the address on the top and the uncle's coat of arms outside the envelope. Oswald's real name was signed to this letter, and this was the one we looked for the answer to, see? But that answer did not come and when three long days had passed away, we all felt most awfully stale about it, knowing the great good we had done for Albert's uncle made our interior feelings very little better, if at all. And on the fourth day Oswald spoke up and said what was in everybody's inside heart. He said, This is futile rot. I vote we write and ask that editor, why he doesn't answer letters. He wouldn't answer that one any more than he did the other, said Noel. Why should he? He knows you can't do anything to him for not. Why shouldn't we go and ask him? H.O. said. He could not not answer us if we was all there, staring him in the face. I don't suppose he'd see you, said Dora, and it's were, not was. The other editor did when I got the guinea for my beautiful poems, Noel reminded us. Yes, said the thoughtful Oswald, but then it doesn't matter how young you are when you're just a poetry seller. But we're the discerning public now, and he'd think we ought to be grown up. I say, Dora, suppose you rigged yourself up in old Blackie's things. You'd look quite twenty or thirty. Dora looked frightened, and said she thought we'd better not. But Alice said, Well, I will then. I don't care. I am as tall as Dora, but I won't go alone. Oswald, you'll have to dress up old and come too. It's not much to do for Albert's uncle's sake. You know you'll enjoy it, said Dora, and she may have wished that she did not so often think that we had better not. However, the die was now cast, and the remainder of this adventure was doomed to be coloured by the die we now prepared. This is an allegory. It means we had burned our boats, and that is another. We decided to do the deed next day, and during the evening Dicky and Oswald went out and bought a grey beard and moustache which was the only thing we could think of to disguise the manly and youthful form of the bold Oswald into the mature shape of a grown-up and discerning public character. Meanwhile, the girls made tiptoe and brigand-like excursions into Miss Blake's room. She is the housekeeper, and got several things. Among others, a sort of undecided thing, like part of a wig, which Miss Blake wears on Sundays. Jane, our housemaid, says it is called a transformation, and that duchesses wear them. 
We had to be very secret about the dressing up that night, and to put Blackie's things all back when they had been tried on. Dora did Alice's hair. She twisted up what little hair Alice has got by natural means, and tied on a long tail of hair that was Miss Blake's too. Then she twisted that up, bun-like, with many hairpins. Then the wiglet, or transformation, was plastered over the front part, and Miss Blake's Sunday hat, which is of a very brisk character, with a half a bluebird in it, was placed on top of everything. There were several petticoats used, and a brown dress and some stockings and hankies to stuff it out where it was too big. A black jacket and crimson tie completed the picture. We thought Alice would do. Then Oswald went out of the room and secretly assumed his dark disguise, but when he came in with the beard on and a hat of father's, the others were not struck with admiration and respect, like he meant them to be. They rolled about, roaring with laughter, and when he crept into Miss Blake's room and turned up the gas a bit and looked in her long glass, he owned that they were right and that it was no go. He is tall for his age, but that beard made him look like some horrible dwarf, and his hair being so short added to everything. Any idiot could have seen that the beard had not originally flourished where it now was, but had been transplanted from some other place of growth. And when he laughed, which now became necessary, he really did look most awful. He has read a beard's wagging, but he never saw it before. While he was looking at himself, the girls had thought of a new idea. But Oswald had an inside presentiment that made it some time before he could even consent to listen to it. But at last, when the others reminded him that it was a noble act, and for the good of Albert's uncle, he let them explain the horrid scheme in all its lurid parts. It was this, that Oswald should consent to be disguised in women's raiments and go with Alice to see the editor. No man ever wants to be a woman, and it was a bitter thing for Oswald's pride, but at last he consented. He is glad he is not a girl. You have no idea what it is like to wear petticoats, especially long ones. I wonder that ladies continue to endure their miserable existences. The top parts of the clothes, too, seem to be too tight and too loose in the wrong places. Oswald's head, also, was terribly in the way. He had no wandering hairs to fasten transformations onto even if Miss Blake had had another one, which was not the case. But the girls remembered a governess they had once witnessed whose hair was brief as any boy's, so they put a large hat with a very tight elastic behind on to Oswald's head, just as it was, and then with a tickly, pussiest, featherish thing round his neck hanging wobbly down in long ends. He looked more young ladylike than he will ever feel. Some courage was needed for the start next day. Things looked so different in the daylight. Remember Lord Nisdale's coming out of the tower, said Alice. Think of the great cause and be brave, and she tied his neck up. I'm brave, all right, said Oswald only I do feel such an ass. I feel rather an ape myself, Alice owned, but I've got three pennyworth of peppermints to inspire us with bravery. It is called Dutch courage, I believe. Owing to our telling Jane, we managed to get out unseen by Blackie. All the others would come, too, in their natural appearance, except that we made them wash their hands and faces. We happened to be flush of chink, so we let them come. But if you do, Oswald said, you must surround us in a hollow square of four. 
So they did, and we got down to the station all right. But in the train there were two ladies who stared, and porters and people like that came round the window, far more than there could be any need for. Oswald's boots must have shown as he got in. He had forgotten to borrow a pair of Jane's, as he had meant to, and the ones he had on were his largest. His ears got hotter and hotter, and it got more and more difficult to manage his feet and hands. He failed to suck any courage of any nation from the peppermints. Owing to the state Oswald's ears were now in, we agreed to take a cab at Cannon Street. We all crammed in somehow, but Oswald saw the driver wink as he put his boot on the step and the porter, who was opening the cab door, winked back, and I am sorry to say Oswald forgot that he was a high-born lady, and he told the porter that he had better jolly well stow his cheek. Then several bystanders began to try and be funny, and Oswald knew exactly what particular sort of fool he was being. But he bravely silenced the fierce warnings of his ears, and when he got to the editor's address, we sent Dick up with a large card that we had written on. Miss Daisy Dolman and the Right Honourable Miss Ethel Truder Bustler on urgent business. And Oswald kept himself and Alice concealed in the cab till the return of the messenger. All right, you're to go up, Dickie came back and said, but the boy grinned who told me so. You'd better be jolly careful. We bolted like rabbits across the pavement and up the editor's stairs. He was very polite. He asked us to sit down, and Oswald did. But first he tumbled over the front of his dress, because it would get under his boots, and he was afraid to hold it up, not having practised doing this. I think I have had letters from you, said the editor. Alice, who looked terrible with the transformation leaning right earward, said yes, and that we had come to say what a fine, bold conception we thought the dog's chapter was. This was what we had settled to say, but she needn't have burst out with it like that. I suppose she forgot herself. Oswell, in the agitation of his clothes, could say nothing. The elastic of the hat seemed to be very slowly slipping up the back of his head, and he knew that, if it once passed the bump that backs of heads are made with, the hat would spring from his head like an arrow from a bow, and all would be frustrated. Yes, said the editor, that chapter seems to have had great success, a wonderful success. I had no fewer than sixteen letters about it all praising it in unmeasured terms. He looked at Oswald's boots, which Oswald had neglected to cover over with his petticoats. He now did this. It is a nice story, you know, said Alice timidly. So it seems, the gentleman went on. Fourteen of the sixteen letters bear the Blackheath postmark. The enthusiasm for the chapter would seem to be mainly local, Oswald would not look at Alice. He could not trust himself with her looking like she did. He knew at once that only the piano tuner and the electric man had been faithful to their trust. The others had all posted their letters in the pillar box just outside our gate. They wanted to get rid of them as quickly as they could, I suppose. Selfishness is a vile quality. The author cannot deny that Oswald now wished he hadn't. The elastic was certainly moving, slowly, but too surely. Oswald tried to check its career by swelling out the bump on the back of his head, but he could not think of the right way to do this. I am very pleased to see you, the editor went on slowly, and there was something about the way he spoke that made Oswald think of a cat playing with a mouse. Perhaps you can tell me. Are there many spiritualists in Blackheath? 
many clairvoyants? Eh? said Alice, forgetting that this is not the way to behave. People who foretell the future, he said. I don't think so, said Alice. Why? His eye twinkled. Oswald saw he had wanted her to ask this. Because, said the editor, more slowly than ever, I think there must be. How otherwise can we account for the chapter about the dog's home being read and admired by sixteen different people before it is even printed? That chapter has not been printed. It has not been published. It will not be published till the May number of the People's Pageant. Yet in Blackheath, sixteen people already appreciate its subtlety and its realism and all the rest of it. How do you account for this, Miss Daisy Dolman? I am the right honourable Ethel Truder, said Alice. At least, oh, it's no use going on. We are not what we seem. Oddly enough, I inferred that at the beginning of our interview, said the editor. Then the elastic finished slipping up Oswald's head at the back, and the hat leapt from its head, exactly as he'd known it would. He fielded it deftly, however, and it did not touch the ground. Concealment, said Oswald, is at an end. So it appears, said the editor. Well, I hope next time the author of the Golden Gondola will choose his instruments more carefully. He didn't. We aren't, cried Alice, and she instantly told the editor everything. Concealment being at an end, Oswald was able to get his trousers pocket. It did not matter now how many boots he showed, and to get out Albert's uncle's letter. Alice was quite eloquent, especially when the editor made her take off the hat with the bluebird, and the transformation and the tail, so that he could see what she really looked like. He was quite decent when he really understood how Albert's uncle's threatened marriage must have upset his brain while he was writing that chapter and pondering on the dark future. He began to laugh then, and kept it up till the hour of parting. He advised Alice not to put on the transformation and the tail again to go home in, and she didn't. Then he said to me, Are you in a finished state under Miss Daisy Dolman? And when Oswald said, Yes, the editor helped him to take off the womanly accoutrements and to do them up in brown paper, and he lent him a cap to go home in. I never saw a man laugh more. He is an excellent sort. But no slow passage of years, however many, can ever weaken Oswald's memory of what those petticoats were like to walk in, and how ripping it was to get out of them, and have your own natural legs again. We parted from the editor without a strain on anybody's character. He must have written to Albert's uncle, and told him all, for we got a letter next week. It said, My dear kiddies, art cannot be forced, nor can fame. May I beg you for the future to confine your exertions to blowing my trumpet, or fame's, with your natural voices. Editors may be led, but they won't be druv. The right honourable Miss Ethel Truda Bustler seems to have aroused a deep pity for me in my editor's heart. Let that suffice, and for the future permit me, as firmly as affectionately, to reiterate the assurance with the advice which I have so often breathed in your long young ears. I am not ungrateful, but I do wish you would mind your own business. That's just because we were found out, said Alice. If we'd succeeded, he'd have been sitting on the top of the pinnacle of fame, and he would have owed it all to us. That would have been making him something like a wedding present. What we had really done was to make something very like, but the author is sure he has said enough. End of chapter